I'm Tracy Lander Garrett, and I am here awkwardly trying to record a presentation to share with you on how to name things in writing, whether it's fiction or comic books or uh, writing for TV or movies or whatever. Uh, when you're naming characters and worlds and products and restaurants and all kinds of things, there are some methods you can use to uh, to come up with interesting names. So I just wanted to kind of go over some of the conventions of naming in comics and other genres a little bit. And you may want to grab yourself some paper and a pencil so that you can do a couple of the writing exercises that accompany this presentation. So please bear with me while I awkwardly toggle between the sharing of my screen and everything else here. Uh, there we go, there's the presentation. Um, so let's take a look. Naming your nouns from Lois Lane to Lipsticks, presented by me, Tracy Lander Garrett for Pflugerville Library for their wonderful library con, which they've been doing for the past few years. And uh, thank you for the opportunity to do this. So naming your nouns from Lois Lane to Lipsticks. I can figure out how to move on to the next slide. There we go. All right. So when you think about names of characters in comic books, you will probably think of Peter Parker or Clark Kent, um, right? Spider-Man, Superman, kind of the most famous superheroes, maybe. Uh, and they both have alliterative names. Maybe you've heard of Bruce Banner, who is the Hulk, or Lex Luthor, who is uh, Superman's main bad guy villain. Are Sue Storm from Fantastic Four, Bucky Barnes from Captain America, Robbie Reyes from uh, Ghost Rider, Jughead Jones from the Archie comics, or Zatanna Zatara out of DC, the magical lady. Um, or maybe you're thinking of cartoons. I didn't even think of cartoons until I started brainstorming for this presentation I was doing. And I was like, oh yeah, Mickey Mouse, Donald Duck, Daffy Duck. All the ducks have D names, right? Daisy Duck. I guess there's the Huey, Dewey, and Louie, but their names at least rhyme. So again, you get that kind of sound um, association for the names. But Bugs Bunny, Porky Pig, Fred Flintstone, Pink Panther, George Jetson, all of these alliterative names. Uh, you can't go wrong with an alliterative name if you want your characters to be memorable, if you want their names to be memorable, I should say. Um, apparently, uh, Stan Lee had issues with remembering names. And so a part of using alliterative names on his part was in an effort to help him remember them. Let's move on to our next slide. Another thing uh, that authors do is they hide meaning within a character name. And plenty of them are given names that hint at their role in the story. And the meaning may be hidden in another language or reference to mythology. Dracula's Lucy Westenra. Her first name, Lucy, means light, and her last name evokes the direction the sun sets in in the west, Westenra, but it also brings up an Egyptian god of the sun, uh, Ra. And if you know anything about vampires and Dracula, then you know they do not like sunlight. So her name is, is pure sunshine um, and kind of hints at the, the role she'll play. She's kind of his downfall. Uh, Harry Potter's Remus Lupin. If you know anything about the history of Rome, then you may know that it was founded by brothers Romulus and Remus, uh, who were supposedly raised by a sheep wolf. Uh, so Remus, the first name is the same as a boy raised by wolves in Roman mythology, but his last name Lupin comes from the Latin Lupinus, meaning wolfish. Of course, spoilers, he's a werewolf. So you get that meaning there right in his name. In Star Wars, Darth Vader, I mean, the first name, uh, well, it's not a name, it's a, his title, I guess, uh, is a variation on dark and then the Dutch word for father. Spoilers. And lastly, Inception's Ariadne. Ariadne, her name refers to a Greek myth about a weaver, and she is the architect or weaver 
of the dream. Another way that you can play around with meaning in a name is to obscure it by using um, a non-standard spelling uh, or by a change in initials, the way that you give them that. So in comics, E. Nigma, Edward Nigma is the Riddler. Dr. Freeze is Mr. Freeze. Joe Coyne, his last name being spelled differently of a coin, is the Penny Plunder. I never even heard of Joe Coyne. Uh, and Harleen Quinzel, Harley Quinn is a Harlequin. Literature, uh, Mr. Hyde hides inside of Jekyll. Spoilers. Peta, his name rhymes with pita bread in the Hunger Games. And Bastion Books in the never-ending story loves books, even though his last name is spelled B-U-X. Uh, in TV, you get I Dream of Jeannie. She's a genie. And then with uh, Montgomery Scott of Star Trek, um, he is Scottish. He is a Scot. So you get those meanings wrapped up in those character names. Um, you know, character names may sound right, they may sound wrong. Anne Bernays and Pamela Painter in their wonderful book of fiction writing prompts, What If, explain the names you give your character should not be drawn out of a hat, but carefully tested to see if they work. Sometimes you may want to choose an appropriate name, Victoria, for a member of the British aristocracy. And once in a while, it's a good idea to choose a name that seems inappropriate, like Bruce for the child of migrant farm workers. And such names will tell readers who the character is, where they come from, and where they're headed. So now we're going to move into doing a writing exercise. And I'm asking you to try it. Take five minutes to try your hand at naming a character and planting a hint within their name. Try naming at least three of these in five minutes or do as many as you can in that period of time. First one, a professional wrestler with the body of an ogre and the mind of a child. An alien explorer from a planet where emotions are forbidden. The football player who feels that he has to hide his love of poetry from his team. A little rich girl who treats her servants like dirt but gets her comeuppance. A superhero who is physically invincible, but awkward and vulnerable in social situations. A Viking king who is ruthless on the battlefield, but kind to his subjects. So I'm going to pause our recording. And again, please bear with the awkwardness as I try to do that. Uh, here we go. Pausing the recording. Maybe, maybe, maybe. There we go. Pause recording. Uh, we'll be back in five minutes. And we're back. So let's, I hope you had some fun playing around with some of those names. Let's move on to our next slide. Um, checking in. You should have a feel at this point for the kinds of names that work and those that don't. Timmy Potts and the Sorcerer's Stone just doesn't have quite the right ring to it, does it? Likewise, Bob the Slob is probably not the most formidable sounding name for a warlike Viking king. Olaf Bloodbringer sounds a bit more appropriate, but Bjorn Hartson may suggest a kinder king. Bjorn means bear, and then you get that heart in there, so you've got a huggable little teddy bear of a name. Um, there's nothing wrong with the name Bob the Slob, if that's the kind of story that you want to tell. Think about SpongeBob SquarePants. It's a crazy name, and yet very popular and definitely tells you a little bit about what you're getting yourself into. It's ridiculous. It's fun. Um, so there's nothing wrong with Bob the Slob if that's the kind of story you want to tell. Try checking in with friends to see what they think of the names that you come up with. Ask them what personality, background, or role the character names suggest to them. What kind of story do they think this character will be a part of? Let's move to our next slide. Yes, so now that we've talked about naming uh, people, let's talk about naming places and things. Fiction writers have to name all manner of places and things from towns to stores and restaurants to nail polish and imaginary TV shows. Remember too that a name hints at what the thing in question is like. So 
but would you want to eat at a seafood restaurant called Fish Bones or Poisson du Mer? One that sounds a little bit um, elegant or elevated because of its French name, whereas the other seems a lot more chill. Uh, either one could be right, depending on story or character. Would your high school teen choose Violet Vamp lipstick or Sweet Sixteen? Names suggest values and preferences, so invent them accordingly. Here comes our next writing exercise. We'll give you another five minutes to do this one. Um, loosen up your imagination by naming at least six of the below things that you ordinarily wouldn't have to name, never mind own. Uh, a desert town, a new disease, a football team, a summer cottage, a beauty salon, a chihuahua, a college town, a pizza place, a love song, a car, a cemetery, a hardware store. So you can mix and match, choose one, skip one, skip three, choose another. You could just do one column, or maybe if you're a mad genius of writing exercises, maybe you can do all of them in that period of time. Again, I'm going to pause the recording. I don't know why I keep pausing the recording, but I'm going to. I think I'm supposed to do. The computer's telling me I have viruses. I don't even know what's going on. Um, no, I would, that's not what I wanted to do either. I told you this was going to be awkward, or I think I told you that. Let's just pause the recording and I'll stop talking for a moment, shall I? All right, I'm back and I'm still awkward. Uh, we are going to go back to sharing screen of the presentation, but I hope that you had some fun with playing around with those names. Um, let's move on to our next slide. Right, sci-fi and fantasy naming. You get some some different challenges with sci-fi and fantasy naming because you you want your world to be different, um, to sound completely invented that uh, you know nobody else has heard. But you want it to be memorable. You want all these other things associated with it. So you you have a lot of choices. Um, you can create entire cultures with their own naming conventions and formats for people. Um, so perhaps everyone's last name incorporates their mother's name, right? We have, we here, we have like Smith's son and uh, I can't even think of other names, um, all the bitch names. Uh, but here like Gwenson instead of, uh, Dan's son, uh, Maris's girl, maybe instead of Maris's daughter. I, I know I've seen the daughter D-O-T-T-I-R name ending in a number of things, but it usually involves a man's name. Um, maybe all of their names incorporate apostrophes like Denton or Mayarth. You know, those are just completely made up words. Um, or maybe you could use an additional word that you've decided in your world means of. In this example, the N apostrophe I decided means of or vel could mean of, but I've, again, I've just made that up. So Janu Nobre or Sana Veldrake sound like kind of interesting characters to me. They definitely sound exotic. Um, the only thing I would say is well, when you make your names, make them interesting, but also try to make them pronounceable because there's nothing worse than reading a word that your brain can't say. You look at the word and you try to sound it out. And then you look at nobody wants to read that. Um, you can also use some uh, some hints in your fiction writing about how uh, how a name should be said. Uh, I remember when in the Harry Potter books when uh, Hermione her name most people were saying Hermione because they'd never seen the name Hermione before. So having some little hint or having a character explain to someone who pronounces their name incorrectly how to pronounce it correctly, um, that could be another thing that you could do. Let us move on to a little bit more explanation on that. Um, sometimes you're inventing a planet, a people, or a creature, and the muse of naming things is elusive. You can take a name, pardon the typo, or a word you know, or remove or change letters to transform a word or a name into something that sounds more exotic. 
So for instance, take the name Joanne, remove the O, now you have Jean. Uh, or if you change out that J for a K, I'm, I'm Letterman over here, change out that J for a K and create Koan. Uh, aquarium, right? Maybe you have a water planet or a water town or something like that. So you could take off the A of Aquarium and call it Aquarium, or take off the end letters and call it Aquari, right? It sounds kind of cool. Sounds like an interesting exotic thing. And yet it's a normal word that we've just changed a little slight bit. You can also choose words from other languages. I do not know how to pronounce these in their, uh, in their original languages with the right accents and sounds, so please do forgive me. Uh, but if you had a peaceful kind of world or town or person even, you could choose pay or pay, I'm not sure again, um, which is French, Udo from Ibo language, Akanya from Amara, death. Uh, for a morbid character, or maybe even like you give the Grim Reaper their own name. Maybe you have a planet of Grim Reapers, a town of Grim Reapers. Uh, Dod, I'm not sure again how to say these. Mertis or Smirk. So you get Danish, Lithuanian, Polish. Just choosing names or words from other languages can again help you just mix things up a little bit. And I think, yeah, we have got one more writing exercise. Uh, where I'm asking you to try your hand at naming the otherworldly. And just take two to three minutes to try naming some of these. We've got a queen of fairies, a land where it is always autumn. That's, I would love to live in a land where it is always autumn. A uh, new constellation and a spaceship. So watch me awkwardly fumble. We'll be right back. If I can out my pausing. There it is. And we're back. So let us head over to our final slide. Um, whether you're a writer, a fan, or a name enthusiast, I hope that this presentation was informative and useful for you. Naming people, places, and things in your fiction can be rewarding and it can be fun a great way to stretch your vocabulary and imagination. So go out and impress your friends. <laughs> if you have the kind of friends who will be impressed by such things, they're good friends to have. Um, go out there and impress them with your own uniquely named universe of nouns. Um, I am going to hit the stop sharing button. And uh, just again, I wanna say thanks to Pflugerville Library for this opportunity. And thank you for watching and I hope you enjoyed it. So take care, be well. And sometime I will hit that stop recording button. There it is. <laughs>